When we looked at groups, one of the important things we looked at were subgroups, that is, subset of a group that itself had the properties of being a group. And when we look at rings, we can do the same thing. We can say that S is a subring of R if S is just a subset of R and S is a ring. Now, there's a rich theory surrounding subrings in general uh, and looking at the various rings that exist within a uh, within a given large ring. Uh, however, just as with group theory, there are certain sub-objects that are special, that are more important uh, in terms of working with factor, um, uh, factor objects. So with the groups, the thing that was important were normal subgroups. You had the set of all subgroups, but then the normal subgroups were the ones that we cared about in terms of building other groups out of a group and a subgroup. Similarly, when we look at a ring, the most important kind of subring that we look at are the ideals. And we'll give that definition now. So definition 96, a, uh, or rather, let R be a ring, I, a left ideal of R is a set I contained in R uh, such that two things happen. First, uh, I is a subgroup of R as additive groups. Now note that this means in particular that the ideal, the set I has to be non-empty. It must include the additive identity zero. Um, it has to be closed under addition and uh, subtraction. Uh, but there's another condition that we need. We need that I is a subgroup of uh, R as additive groups, but we also need that for every uh, little r inside the ring r and little x inside the ideal i, uh, we have that r times x also belongs to i. Now notice that this here is a stronger condition than saying that the set I is closed under multiplication. If we said that I was closed under multiplication, that would only say that given two elements within the ideal, we could multiply them together and stay in the ideal. This condition two here is stronger. So this is what makes a subset into a, um, into an ideal rather than, than just an arbitrary subring. Uh, and it says that if I take any element of my ideal and any element of my ring at all, then, uh, and I multiply the ring element on the left of the element x from i, I stay inside i. So to say that a set is an ideal uh, by itself doesn't really give full information. A set is an ideal of a certain ring. And it's entirely possible that you could have a chain of rings where the first is an ideal of the second, but is not an ideal of the, of the third. Uh, so to say that a set is an ideal uh, requires information both about the set itself and the ring that it sits inside. This is why we usually, uh, when we need to be precise, we say that uh, a set is an ideal of a certain ring or indicate that the ring some other way. So this is a left ideal. And the left here refers to the fact that in this multiplication, we're taking the, the ring element, the arbitrary ring element, and multiplying it on the left of the element from I. Uh, a right ideal is defined similarly. 
uh, a right ideal of R is a set I contained in R such that um, two things happen. The first is the same. I is a subgroup of R as additive groups. And number two, for every little r in r and x in i, we have that x times r is in i. So here, the product is on the right. We're taking an element of our ideal, multiplying it on the right by, some, by any element of the ring r, and that has to also lie within the ideal i. And uh, so we can see that the two definitions are, uh, are symmetric. And we've got left ideals and right ideals. Now, clearly, if we're in a commutative ring, then there's no difference between a left ideal and a right ideal, because r times x and x times r will always be the same thing. So if an ideal, if a set is a left ideal, it's a right ideal, and vice versa. Although in non-commutative rings, there can be a difference, and we'll see an example of that. Uh, however, uh, we do have a term if, uh, if a set happens to be a left and a right ideal, as in the commutative case. So if I is a left and right ideal, it is simply called an ideal. Uh, now, going forward, uh, some of the theorems that we're going to have, uh, I'm just going to use the term ideal uh, when talking about it. In most cases, you can put the word left or right in front of all instances of the word ideal in a theorem, and the result will be true. We'll point out um, any situations where that's not the case. All right, so let's look at some examples. Uh, so, uh, uh, let's let R be the ring Z, the integers with addition and multiplication, uh, and N uh, just some, uh, some integer. Uh, the sets N, Z, which are the set of all multiples of n are uh, ideals of, uh, of z. Uh, so we have two things to check whenever we want to say that something's an ideal. Um, now, first of all, notice that this ring is commutative, and so checking to see whether uh, whether a set is an ideal just means checking to see whether it's a left ideal, or checking to see that it's a right ideal because they're all the same in this case. Uh, so, um, notice that we already know uh, that uh, the sets N, Z are subgroups of uh, this the group Z as additive groups. All right, so that's great. Certainly if I take two, uh, two numbers and I uh, add them or subtract them, uh, if they're both multiples of N, then their sum or their difference is going to be a multiple of N. Also, uh, if R is any element of our ring R, which is Z, and x is any element of our ideal nz, then that means that x is equal to n times some, uh, some integer y. Uh, but therefore, if we take this element r and multiply it by x, that's the same as r multiplied by ny, which is n times ry. 
Now this r times y, we don't know exactly what it is. The r could be any integer, the y could be any integer, but in any case, we have n times an integer, which lies in the subgroup, uh, I'm sorry, within the subset nz. So we checked that the set nz, the multiples of n, were an additive group, and that if you multiply any element of this set by any other element of the ring, then, or by any element of the ring, then it stays in that set. And therefore, uh, all the multiples of a given number form an ideal. Let's look at some more examples. Uh, given any ring R, the trivial subring uh, containing only the element zero is an ideal of R. Uh, it's certainly the trivial uh, subgroup uh, as additive groups and if you take any element of R and multiply it by zero then you get zero back which means that um, if you multiply any element of this ideal by any element of the ring it stays in the ideal. Uh, this is called uh, the trivial ideal. Uh, so that's at one extreme. This is sort of the smallest ideal that you can get. Because ideals have to be additive subgroups, they all have to contain zero, the additive identity. Uh, and so since the set containing only zero is an ideal, it's the smallest ideal. On the other extreme, we could look at the set containing absolutely everything that it could. Part of the definition of an ideal was that we had to be working with a subset of the ring R, and the largest subset of R is just the whole set R itself. Uh, the entire ring R is, a, uh, is an ideal of R, and uh, this is... Uh, even easier to see, R is certainly a subgroup of itself. And if I take any two things in R and multiply them together, I'm going to lie back in the ring R again because of the definition of what an operation is. That R has to be closed under multiplication. Uh, this is called the unit ideal of R. Uh, the explanation for the term unit ideal of the ring R uh, is going to come in the exercises. Uh, it is related to the concept of units of a ring. Okay, so let's consider some uh, more complex examples. So let's let R be the ring of all polynomials with real coefficients and uh, in the variable little x. And let's let S be the set of uh, polynomials consisting only of terms with even degree. So this set S is the set of all polynomials containing only even degree terms. Uh, now S is a ring. It contains the zero element. It's closed under addition and subtraction. It's closed under polynomial multiplication as long as you're only taking things within the, uh, the set S. If I take two uh, polynomials that are uh, that only contain terms of even degree and multiply them together the result will only have terms of even degree left uh, 
so S is a ring, but not an ideal of R. It's a subset of R. Uh, it's a sub ring of R, I should say, but it's not an ideal of R. Now to show that something's not an ideal, uh, it's, it's very simple. You just have to give one example of something that's in S and something that's in R, multiply them together and show that the result isn't in S. So for example, let's, uh, let, uh, let's let F equal, um, X squared, which lies in S. And let's let G equal just the polynomial X, which lies in R, just the, uh, just the polynomial X. Uh, we have that uh, F times G is equal to X squared times X, which is X cubed, which is of odd degree and therefore does not lie in S. So that means that it's possible to take something in S, multiply it by something else in the ring R, and land somewhere outside of S, meaning that S is not an ideal. So S is not an ideal of R. Okay, so we've got, uh, we've got here an example of a subset which is a sub ring, but not an ideal. Let's take another example with this same ring. Let's let R be the set of polynomials with coefficients uh, in the real numbers. Uh, and let's let I uh, be the set of all uh, polynomials with no degree uh, 0, 1, or 2 term uh, unioned with the polynomial 0, because the ideal i uh, certainly has to contain 0. Now, it turns out that uh, this set i uh, is a, uh, an additive subgroup of uh, of R. If I take polynomials that have no degree 0, 1, or 2 terms, that is all their terms are degree 3 or higher, then if I add them or subtract them, uh, then I will certainly uh, stay within that set. So I is certainly a subgroup of R as additive groups. Uh, but now let's see uh, why I is an ideal. Now, uh, in the last example, we showed that uh, something wasn't an ideal, and we just had to give two specific elements, some specific element from the set, and some specific element from the ring that multiplied in the right way. To prove that something's an ideal is harder, you need to show that no matter what you take inside I, no matter what you take inside R, then we get, uh, then we get something that lies in I. I. Uh, so let's go ahead and do that. Uh, let's let F uh, with, uh, be um, uh, B0 plus B1x plus B2x squared up through B uh, M x to the M B in R. So this is any random polynomial in R. And let's let G, which is a3x cubed plus a4x to the fourth plus blah, 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 plus anx to the n lies in I. You'll notice that I've written it with no degree 0, 1, or 2 terms. So now, if we consider the product fg, we can notice that every term of fg uh, is a sum of expressions of the form ajx to the j times uh, 
v i x to the i. Although I guess I got those um, I got those backwards, but everything's commutative here, which looks like a j times b i times x to the j plus i. But importantly, this is where j is greater than or equal to three because uh, the a j x to the j is going to be a term from g and all of those indices j are greater than or equal to three. So that means that every term of f g has degree at least three. So every term of f g has degree at least three. So f g belongs to the ideal i. And since we took any random element of r and any random element of g and showed that this worked, that proves that i is in fact an ideal of the ring r. All right, one more example before we go on to proving some things about ideals. Uh, let's consider a non-commutative example. Let's let R be the set of two by two matrices with real entries. And let's let I be the set of matrices of the form 0, 0, A, B, where A and B belong to uh, the real numbers. Now, uh, so I consists of all matrices uh, in R which have a zero first column. All right, so uh, we claim that I is a left ideal. Because we're in a non-commutative ring, we need to be uh, precise about what we're saying. If we say um, we're not ready to claim yet that it's an ideal, to prove that it's an ideal without any adjective, we would need to prove that it's both a left and a right ideal. We're not ready to do that. Let's just prove that it's a left ideal of R. Uh, first of all, it's easy to see uh, that um, I is an additive subgroup of, uh, of R. If you add two matrices that in I together, you're going to get another matrix in I. If you subtract them, they're in I. The zero matrix belongs to I, all those things. So I is definitely an additive subgroup of R. So now we want to let W, X, Y, Z uh, be any element of R. And we want zero A, zero B to be any element of i. Because we're trying to check for uh, being a left ideal, we want to multiply uh, the element from the ring on the left and the element from the ideal on the right. Now we're just going to multiply these together using standard matrix multiplication. So First entry, we get w times 0 plus x times 0 gives 0. w times a plus x times b gives a w plus b x. Uh, y times 0 plus z times 0 gives 0. And then y times a plus z times b gives a y plus z b. And the only thing we need to check now is does this matrix belong to the ideal i? And in this case, we can see that it clearly does. I has a very simple description. It's all the matrices with zero column one, and this matrix has zero column one. So we took any random element of R, any random element of, of I, multiplied them together with the ring element on the left, and we got something that lies back in I. So we could say that I is closed under left multiplication by elements of R, if, uh, if we wanted to express it in words that way. Uh, so this means that I is an ideal. Uh, however, I is not a right ideal. 
let's see that. Now, again, to prove that something's not a right ideal, we just need to take something in I times something in R, and we can take specific things here, which is very nice, and we need to show that we get something which isn't in I. This is what we're trying to go for. So it turns out that uh, in this case, and in many cases when something is not an ideal or is not um, a right ideal or it's not a left ideal, usually it's not too hard to find counterexamples. If you just start picking random elements of your ring and random elements of your ideal, you'll probably find a counterexample pretty quickly. So in this case, we're not going to look too hard. We're just going to take an element from the ideal 0, 1, 0, 1, and an element from the ring, just the matrix full of ones, one, 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 and multiply them and see what we get. So we get zero times one plus one times one is one, and we can see already we're going to get something that's not in I. However, for completeness, it's, it's good form not to leave your computations unfinished. Uh, so in this case, we see that this element from the ideal I times an element from the idea, from the ring R gives us something that does not lie in the ideal I. So that shows that I is not a right ideal. So uh, here's an example illustrating that R distinction is an important one uh, because without an example like this, one could reasonably ask the question, do there exist left ideals that aren't right ideals? Well, yes, there are. And one can just as easily come up with examples of right ideals that are not left ideals. Uh, but I remind you that this distinction only exists inside non-commutative rings. Most, many of the rings that we consider are commutative, and in, that, in those cases, it's just the one concept of ideal. All right, next we're going to talk about how we can uh, build ideals out of other ideals or out of ring elements. Uh, so the first thing is uh, we're going to consider is the intersection of two ideals. So theorem 97, uh, something we're going to, uh, it's going to be very important for a definition coming up later on. Uh, if I and J are ideals of a ring R, then I intersect J is an ideal. Uh, more generally, we can say that uh, if script A is an indexing set and I subscript alpha is an ideal of R for all um, for all alpha inside this indexing set, which could be finite or infinite. A is an index set A, uh, I alpha is an ideal of R for all alpha in A. Uh, then the intersection of the I alphas over all of the alphas inside A is an ideal. In other words, you can take the intersection of any number of ideals, including infinitely many, including uncountably many ideals, and you still get an ideal. Uh, for the proof here, we're just going to go ahead and prove the first sentence here because it illustrates the sort of arguments that you use when, uh, when working with ideals. Uh, so, uh, we want to show that I intersect J is an ideal. Remember that there are two parts to this. We need to show that it is a subgroup of R, uh, an additive subgroup of R, and we need to show that it's closed under multiplication uh, by, um, uh, by elements of R. Uh, now, this is also another theorem where we've stated it for ideals, uh, but if you were to put the adjective left in front of all of your, all of the, 
all of the words ideal here, then this would be another true true theorem. And if you were to put the uh, the word right in front of all of them, then this would be a true statement again. So the intersection of any number of left ideals is a left ideal. The intersection of any number of right ideals is a right ideal, and so on. We are just going to prove it for ideal for. Um, Really, we're going to prove it for one side uh, of them and then note that the um, the other side works uh, just as well, uh, or just the same way, I should say. All right, so uh, proof of the first part. Uh, so first of all, we have that since I and J are additive subgroups of R, so is... I intersect J. The intersection of two subgroups is a subgroup. Uh, we know that from group theory. So that takes care of the first part of the definition of being an ideal. So now let's let R be in a little r be in the ring R and X be in the intersection I intersect J. We want to show that R times X lies in I intersect J. Since uh, x is in I intersect j, uh, we have that x belongs to I and x belongs to j, just unwinding uh, what that means. But now we can use the fact that since I and j are ideals of R, we know that r times x belongs to i and r times x belongs to j because i and j are both ideals of r therefore they have this property of being closed by left multiplication by something in r uh, thus rx lies in i intersect j so this means that i intersect j is a uh, left ideal. Uh, the um, proof that it is a right ideal is symmetric. That is um, we have that x times r will belong to i and x times r will belong to j because again i and j are ideals and therefore that means that x times r belongs to i intersect j so these are the sorts of uh, sorts of statements that uh, one can prove about uh, about ideals now, the union of two ideals is not generally an ideal. Um, the intersection is, the union is not, and the same is true for subgroups. Um, however, uh, we do have uh, another operation on ideals. We're going to talk about the sum of two ideals, and the sum of two ideals is going to be a set which contains both I and J, and therefore contains their union, but is going to be bigger, uh, because just the union of I and J isn't an ideal most of the time. So, uh, I union J uh, is usually not an ideal. And you can come up with plenty of examples to, uh, to convince yourself of this. Uh, however, we have uh, the notion of I plus J, which is, uh, which is an ideal. And it's going to be defined in this, uh, in this next theorem. So theorem 98. So let's let I and J be uh, left ideals uh, of a ring R. Uh, this will also work if you replace all the lefts with rights or just take them away. That's what I should have done in the last theorem is is put in left in order to make it work properly. So sorry about that. Uh, 
that little hiccup here. Uh, so this left can be replaced with either right or just nothing at all. Uh, so let i and j be left ideals of a ring R and let i plus j, this is by definition going to be the set of all elements of the ring of the form x plus y, where x is an element of i and y is an element of j. So you look at all the elements of i, all the elements of j, and you add them all together and you take all of the things that you, uh, that you get from those sums. Uh, so the conclusion is that then i plus j is a left ideal of r. So if I take two ideals and I look at this, the set of all sums you could possibly get from those ideals, then I get another ideal of r. And this is another proof that is a uh, fairly standard one. In this case, uh, we're going to need to do a little bit of work to show that I, this set i plus j is a subring of r because it uh, doesn't correspond to any sort of operation we did um, with subgroups. Uh, although, no, I'm, I'm sorry, I, uh, I take that back. It does correspond to some of the things we did with, uh, with subgroups, but even so, it will... A, we, one could possibly make an argument that way. We're going to do it directly. So we're going to start off by showing that i plus j is an additive subgroup of R. Uh, first thing we want to do is to show that it's non-empty. Uh, we can do that and show that it contains the additive identity at the same time. Uh, so uh, we have that since 0 belongs to i, i is an ideal, so it has to contain 0, uh, and 0 belongs to j, similarly, uh, we have that zero is, which is equal to zero plus zero, belongs to i plus j. So the set i plus j at least contains the element zero. Uh, so now let's suppose that a and b belong to i. Uh, we wish to show uh, I'm sorry, not to i, but to i plus j. Uh, we wish to show that a minus b is in i plus j. This is the one-step subgroup test uh, for groups, um, but we're writing it using subtraction because we're working in additive groups. Uh, so, uh, in order to do this, we need to show that a minus b can be written as a sum of elements, one of which comes from i and one of which comes from j. What we know about a and b is that each of them come from uh, this set i plus j. So that means that there exist uh, an x and an x prime in i and a y and a y prime in j such that a is equal to x plus y and b is equal to x prime plus y prime. We are not making any sort of uniqueness statement here. To say that a belongs to the set i plus j simply means that it can be written as a sum of two things, one of which comes from i and one of which comes from j. Generally speaking, there will be lots of different ways of expressing a as uh, a sum of things from i and j, and similarly for b. Uh, but we know that there exist some x and y that work this way for a, and some x prime and y prime that work this way for b. So that means that x, uh, sorry, a minus b, we want to show that this belongs to i plus j, so we have to show that it's written as a sum of two things, one in i, one in j. So a minus b is equal to x plus y minus x prime plus y prime. And now we're going to rearrange this a little bit. We can write this as x minus x prime plus y minus y prime. Uh, but here's the thing, x and x prime both belong to the ideal i. 
and therefore they're different stuff because i is an additive subgroup. So this part belongs to i. y minus y prime belongs to j uh, because y and y prime belong to j and therefore this, this sum right here belongs to i plus j. So that shows us that i plus j is an additive subgroup. Uh, of R. I'm going to erase. Right, this. All right, so then there's uh, one more step. We need to show that um, if we take, uh, say, this element A and multiply it by any element of the ring R, then we stay inside the set I plus J. So let's let little r be in r. Since i and j are ideals, we have that rx belongs to i and ry belongs to j, because x belongs to i and y belongs to j. So this means that r times a, which is equal to r times x plus y, which is Rx plus Ry because of distribution, this now belongs to I plus J. Hence, I plus J is a left ideal. Oh, man, I barely managed to, uh, to get that in there. All right, so this, uh, this sum here uh, can uh, represent a lot of different things depending on uh, depending on what you're doing. It describes all possible sums of, of elements in the two ideals. Uh, we can do uh, one example here and see a connection to something we looked at at the beginning of the previous course. So let's uh, let 8z, uh, or sorry, let's let r be the uh, ring of integers z. Let's let i be the ideal 8z. We've already checked to see that this is an ideal. Let's let j be the ideal 12z. Uh, so we've got these, uh, we've got these two ideals, uh, and so we can um, uh, we can look and uh, and see what like all their different sums and differences are. We could even make a little uh, make a little table here. So we've got the elements of 8z over here. We go from 0, uh, 8, 16, 24, negative 8, negative 16, negative 24. And the elements of 12z, 0, 12, 24, 0, negative 12, negative 24, and we can create a little addition table between the two to see what sorts of things might lie in the uh, the sum of these two ideals. So all the elements up here will be elements that lie in i plus j. So we get, um, we get stuff like negative 48, negative 36, negative 24, uh, negative 12, 0, uh, negative 40, uh, negative uh, 28, negative 16, negative 4, and negative 8, uh, negative 8 minus 24, negative 32, negative 20, negative 8, negative 4, uh, or sorry, positive 4. Uh, positive 4, 16, and we can continue uh, like this. Uh, and uh, one thing that you'll notice here is that not every element of the sum is divisible by 8, and not every element of the sum uh, is uh, 
is divisible by 12 either. So the sum uh, definitely contains all of the elements of the two ideals uh, that we started with. Uh, you'll notice that the uh, one of these columns here corresponding to 0 from 12z is 8z. So the, the set 8z is certainly part of the sum. And similarly, we've got... Uh, Sorry, not that one, but this one down here. This row of the addition table uh, is the set of all elements in 12z. So 12z is certainly a subset of this, but there are plenty of things in here that don't belong to either one. Uh, we have uh, 4 and negative 20 and, a whole, and 32 and a whole bunch of others. Now, you will, you will notice, though, that um, all of the elements here are divisible by uh, by four, and uh, uh, everything here. Oops, sorry, I messed that up. Everything here is divisible by four. In fact, if we look, we can find all of the multiples of four. Uh, going throughout here. We've got 0, 4, uh, we've got 8, 12, 16, 20, and so forth. Uh, 24 is around here somewhere. There we go. 24, 28, 32, 36. And it's just going to keep going, and you've got the negatives as well. So in fact, it looks like the sum of these two ideals is going to be the set of all multiples of four. And in fact, that's correct. Uh, that's correct. And in general, what we have is that the sum of the two ideals mz and nz is going to be equal to dz, where d is the greatest common divisor of m and m. Uh, and this is uh, this is a way that we can understand what's going on in terms of sums of ideals, in terms of more um, commonly understood uh, things, things that we've seen a bunch before. Now, for the proof of this, you can basically go back to the very first chapter, uh, very first things that we did in the last course, where we we're talking about greatest common divisor and we defined it as the smallest positive number in such and such a set and that set that we came up with was actually defined in the same sort of way as the sums of ideals are defined now all right so uh, the operations of intersection and sum tell us how we can take two ideals and get a new ideal out of them uh, the next question is, how do we come up with these ideals in the first place? We sometimes do it by descriptions like we've had earlier. We described ideals inside polynomial rings and inside matrix rings. But uh, describing ideals like that is typically not the most efficient way of doing things and also not the most natural approach to it when we actually go to solve problems or study things with them. Now, the most common way that we study them is by using what are known as generators. So let's look at definition 99. So let's let R be a ring and let's let A contained in R be any subset of R. Now most commonly we're going to be looking at subsets that are um, finite, uh, but sometimes those subsets could be infinite. We make no restriction in the definition. So by this notation, a set of parentheses around A, uh, we denote the smallest ideal containing A. And we say that the set A 
generates uh, the ideal um, generated by A. We will often use the, the phrase, the ideal generated by something or other. Uh, another piece of terminology related to this idea uh, is that we say an ideal I is finitely generated if um, I is equal to the ideal generated by some set, which is finite. Uh, and then finally, if I happens to be generated by just a single element, uh, we say that I is principal. We're going to have uh, opportunity to study principal ideals uh, in some detail a little bit later. And they are ideals generated by a single element. Uh, now, a couple of notes. First of all, the question of whether an ideal is finitely generated or not is one that has motivated a huge amount of study in uh, algebra in general. In fact, one of the greatest theorems in all of algebra is known as Hilbert's basic, uh, basis theorem, approved by the mathematician Hilbert around the turn of the 20th century. And he proved that any ideal in a polynomial ring is finitely generated. This was a big deal and continues to be a pretty big deal. Uh, and... Um, it's uh, very useful for a lot of things that, uh, that we want to do uh, in mathematics. Now, the other thing that I'll note is that um, I'm defining this notation uh, as the smallest ideal containing the set A. It's not actually clear, it's not 100% clear that such an ideal exists. How do we know that there's not a whole bunch of ideals that are bigger than, or that contain the set A, but maybe there's always a smaller one. We're dealing with rings that can be very, very large and have lots and lots of ideals. We can deal with infinite chains of ideals reasonably often. And so we could ask, well, why isn't it the case? How do we know that, we, that we're not in a situation, that we can never be in a situation where we, no matter what ideal we take that contains this set, there's always a smaller one. We have to justify that, and that's the content of our last theorem for this section, Theorem 100. Theorem 100 says, uh, let R be a um, uh, sorry, one second. Sorry about that. Uh, let R be a ring uh, and A any subset of R. Uh, we have that the ideal generated by A is equal to uh, two different descriptions here. It's equal to the intersection of all ideals that contain A, uh, it's the, sorry, it's equal to the intersection of all ideals which contain A, uh, which is equal to also the following description. Uh, it's the set basically of all um, R linear combinations of elements of the generating set. It's basically equal to the set of all things that you get by taking elements of your generating set, multiply them, multiplying them by elements of your ring R, and then adding them all up together. All possible uh, uh, coefficients, R1 through Rn, 
all possible uh, selections of elements from the generating set, A1 through AN. You look at all the possible different ways of adding up a bunch of stuff together, and this gives you your, uh, your ideal I. Oh, one thing that I did need to note here, uh, this applies when R is a uh, commutative ring. Uh, we could also talk about um, what happens in a non-commutative ring, but the, uh, the expression here gets, uh, gets significantly more complicated. And most of the places where we will use this theorem are in commutative rings anyway. All right, so let's go to the proof. Now there's actually two parts of this proof. There's two equalities to prove. And um, the first one, uh, saying that the uh, ideal generated by A is equal to this intersection, is actually the sort of the justification for using this notation at all that says that if you take the intersection of all ideals that contain I, this is certainly possible to do. You can certainly define this set, but we're claiming that it's actually equal to the ideal uh, generated by A, the smallest ideal which contains uh, which contains A. All right, so we want to say let A belong to uh, be a set contained in R, uh, and let's let J be the ideal generated by A. Uh, now, by definition, uh, A is a subset of J, because by definition, this means that J is the smallest ideal which contains the set A. Uh, therefore, we have the following string of of, of containments. Uh, J, uh, by definition, is equal to the ideal generated by A, which is, sorry, not equal. Uh, now, if I take any ideal which contains A, any ideal which contains A will contain the ideal generated by A, uh, and therefore, uh, if I intersect all of the ideals containing A, uh, containing A, uh, then, uh, then I will still get something that contains A. Uh, but J itself is an ideal of the ring which contains the set A, and therefore, it is one of the ideals in this intersection. One of the ideals in this intersection is, in fact, the ideal J, which uh, means that this has to be uh, contained in J itself. Uh, hence, we have equality throughout. And so we have that J, which is the smallest ideal containing I, is, in fact, equal to the intersection of all ideals which contain A. All right, so that sort of justifies this notation, the uh, ideal generated by A. Let's now go and prove that it can be described by basically taking all the possible um, combinations here. So, uh, Let's let K be this set that we have up here, the set, set consisting of all sums of the form R1A1 plus a bunch of stuff, uh, R2A2 up through plus RNAN, where the RIs come from the ring R and the AIs come from the set A. We're going to try and show that K is equal to J. Uh, for any RI in R, and AI in A, we have that A belongs to J, it's a subset of J, so that means that R, little ri times little AI has to belong to J, since J is an ideal. Uh, since J is also closed, under addition, uh, we must have that um, any sum of these terms must uh, belong to J, and therefore any element of K 
must be a uh, must belong to J. So K is some subset of J. So uh, so that's good there. However, K is also uh, an ideal. Uh, this is an exercise. So K is also an ideal uh, and uh, it's it contains a because any element of a could be written as one times a and that's it that would be uh, that would be a fine sum there so k is also an ideal containing a uh, so that means that j has to be contained in k thus j is equal to k and that finishes the proof all right, uh, before I end, let me just double check. Uh, I've got one. Uh, uh, I did leave out a word, a very important word here. A has to be any non-empty subset of R. We don't talk about the ideal generated by an empty set. Uh, and I uh, noticed that when, uh, when going through the proof that we needed to make sure not to do that. All right, so there we go. This gives us a, a useful description of ideals. Um, it tells us that the uh, ideal generated by any set can be thought of as just the set of all possible ways of combining the, those generators together with coefficients coming from the ring, at least when we're working in commutative rings.